In the previous three episodes, we have studied those fungi that have the pileus and stipe, or cap and stem shape, or those fungi that have had the bracket or shell shape. These are indeed what most people think of as mushrooms or fungi, and they are frequently observed growing out of the ground on grass or under trees, or growing as shells out of the sides of trees. But there is another class of fungi that we have not looked at at all yet, and these are known as the jelly fungi. While most pileus and stipe and bracket mushrooms have a solid, even sometimes woody feel, the jelly fungi are aptly named as they have a gelatin feel and even texture. Here you see tiny buds of a jelly fungi called Tremella mesenterica, which is butter, emerging out of its favorite growth medium, a rotting stump. And while some jelly fungi will assume a particular shape, other jelly fungi, such as witch's butter, will assume a variety of gelatinous lobe shapes as they grow. However, as one comes to understand these particular fungi, one realizes that even these apparently amorphous blobs have a certain form and shape to them that lends to their identification. Jelly fungi tend to be small and almost overlooked in the world of mycology, but they play important roles in nature in the biodegradation of natural detritus, such as rotting wood, and it's also very handy for foragers to get to know this class, because, insofar as I am aware, there are no poisonous jelly fungi to be found anywhere in North America. And while Wikipedia reports that some may be toxic, it seems to be referring to lookalikes, which one would have to use one's imagination at a considerable stretch to consider a lookalike. And according to doctors Orson and Hope Miller, who I consider to be much more reliable sources, no jelly fungi have been reported to have any meaningful levels of toxicity. Jelly fungi come in all different shapes and sizes, such as the brain-shaped witch's butter in this image. Others can be bud or lobe-like. Some can even have a more typical mushroom-like form, while others may seem like blobs of jelly. And while they can come from wildly different places on the tree of life, not even being of the same order, they all share some common traits, such as the lack of toxicity, and in particular, that jelly-like or rubber-like form that makes them stand out. Their form and structure tends to be very soft and easily broken down when handled, and they are almost impossible to transport intact. They share the interesting characteristic that if they are dried out, they reduce to almost nothing, but they can be rehydrated back to something close to their original form. Up till now, we have studied fungi, which reproduce by spreading spores by way of gills and pores. Jelly fungi have neither gills nor pores, instead distributing spores directly off the main body of their lobes and bulbs. Jelly fungi come in a variety of colors and forms, so we'll take a look at three distinctive types to help you gain an overall perspective on their nature. We'll take a close look at the variety of species that are known as orange jellies, and which are alternatively known as witch's butter. We'll take a look at Pseudohydnum gelatinosum, unusual in that it appears like a transparent, jelly-like hedgehog mushroom, and Auricularia americana, also known as the jelly ear which I understand is eaten a fair bit on the western side of North America, though here in the eastern side of North America, it is unusual, even a bit of a rare find, at least up here in the Acadian forest where I live, and I don't generally hear a forager seeking it out or eating it. Let's begin by taking a closer look at Auricularia americana. The Auricularia is a fungus which can appear at any time of the year, though cooler times, like in early spring and mid to late autumn, are optimal. However, here in the north, after a cool summer rain, it can also appear. I understand that further south and out west it appears in abundance, but in the Acadian forest where I live, it is at best an uncommon sight. And I pick one now and then for variety, though by and large I leave them alone, as I am always loath to pick unusual and uncommon fungi. As you can see in the image, the auricularia fungus is not called the jelly ear for nothing. It can look very, very much like a human ear, right down to canal and vein structure. However, this fungus can also appear in very much a cup shape, and they can appear singularly, as in here and they can appear in clusters as well. I find that when they appear singularly, they are more likely to take on the ear shape for which they are named. As I noted earlier, there are no known poisonous jelly fungi. However, there are some somewhat poisonous cup fungi, a variety of fungi we haven't actually studied yet. But when the jelly ear fungus takes on more of a cup shape, as it is wont to do, they might potentially be confused for a cup fungus. However, it's easy enough to discern one from the other. Just make sure your jelly ears actually have a gelatinous texture. Jelly ears are about the size of a human ear or smaller, and in color from brown to reddish. They will be found emerging from stumps and logs, and sometimes may seem covered in a pale powder, which are their spores. The spores themselves will be pale white, creamy, or yellowish. In the above image, we have a cluster of jelly ears forming, some going for the cup shape, some partially into the ear shape, and one fully mature one well into the ear shape. 
Notice how the large, mature jelly ear, the one fully in the ear shape, appears to be covered in a whitish dust. Those are the spores emerging to be scattered by an autumn wind. So, if you feel the need to do a spore test with the jelly ear, watch for white, creamy, or yellowish spores that will differ substantially in color from the parent fungus. Recent genetic testing reveals that North America has its own unique auricularia fungi, and one should think of the species designation Americana as a mere placeholder name while geneticists work out the ins and outs of the various American species. However, they differ from species of jelly ear to be found elsewhere in the world in that the North American fungi are quite happy to feed on conifers, and typically when I find them, they are growing from the stumps and logs of dead conifers. As noted before, the world of fungal genetics is, to put it mildly, a mess right now. Increasing technology has led to genetic testing becoming very accessible, and mycologists all over the world are making use of this. And what that genetic testing is revealing is that it is very hard to tell fungi by their form, or even their habitat, or even their ecology, where they like to grow and what they like to feed on. Fungi have many genders, and interbreed, as well as interact with the environment in ways well beyond our understanding at this time. So at this time, we'll avoid the mistake of trying to be extremely precise with identifying North American Auricularia fungi, and simply dub them Auricularia Americana, or jelly ears, and say that if you think you have found one, if you can definitively determine that it is in fact a jelly fungus, and it meets the characteristics of the Auricularia, then you can safely say you have a jelly ear, and leave it at that for now at least to the mycologists, have the genetics worked out. Now and then I harvest a few of these, typically if I'm out camping, and want something to enrich a soup or stew that I might have bubbling over a fire. I would liken using them to dropping a bit of tofu into a soup or stew, just to add some nutrients and make it more filling. They're good at picking up flavor, but don't really contribute to any flavor of their own. All right, let's turn our attention to what is to me one of the most interesting fungi to be found in the woods anywhere. This fungus, known as Pseudohydnum gelatinosum, is found all around the world and in many environments, and it comes in many sizes, and feeds on many different types of wood. And while presently there is only the one species known, the fact that it is found in so many environments, fitting into so many different ecologies, suggests that there are a variety of species that share roughly the same morphology. But to me, what is really interesting about this particular fungus is that it is a jelly fungus, which is also a toothed mushroom. I remember many years ago when I first discovered this fungus growing in the forest near my homestead and wondering what on earth was it? I couldn't figure out what it was and it wasn't mentioned in the field guides I was presently working with and given that we had no access to the internet at the homestead at that time due to our semi-remote location, I couldn't find data on it. It was also a rare find, obviously requiring specific growing conditions, at least in the area where I live, though it is found commonly throughout the rest of the world. Eventually, my field guide collection increased, and we were able to get satellite internet, and I was finally able to identify this intriguing mushroom, which up till then I had called transparent hedgehogs. Now, I was 99.99% .99 certain that this mushroom was edible, since there are no known poisonous tooth fungi, as well as no known poisonous jelly fungi. However, I did not experiment with it. There is an old adage among mushroom foragers. There are old mushroomers, and there are bold mushroomers, but there are no old, bold mushroomers. But my suspicion that it was edible was eventually confirmed when I was able to get more data. I suspect, from the variety of common names listed above, that this fungus has confused many other fungal enthusiasts in the past, as the common names themselves don't seem to be able to decide on what it is. By identification standards, however, identifying this particular fungus is straightforward, and I don't know of any lookalikes that would confuse somebody who has even a modest level of mushroomy experience. This jelly mushroom has a distinctive pileus and stipe, or cap and stem, and it emerges out of dead wood. It is saprobic, meaning that it feeds on dead wood. By causing a white rot as it breaks the wood down into nutritional material, it is a smallish fungus, with the pileus being 2.5 to 5.5 centimeters wide, in general, and the stipes being up to 3 centimeters long. It is gregarious, however, and likes to grow out of dead wood in groups. The caps are tongue, or kidney-shaped, and have tucked-in margins when they are young. They tend to start off as sort of translucent white and turn grayish or brownish as they age. The top of the cap may feel like it has a slight fuzz on it. However, it's hard to see because of the mushroom's essential gelatinous and translucent nature. They do not feel slimy or wet, but they definitely feel gelatinous. And on a mushrooming forum, I know of one person who suggested they could be confused with Pleurocybella porogens, the angel wing mushroom, which also likes to grow off dead and decaying wood in similar locations and circumstances and is also gregarious. However, the angel wing tends to be whiter, 
kind of a pure ethereal white in contrast to the forest around it, thinner, and most distinctly, the angel wing is gilled. Which brings up the really important identification telltale with Pseudohydnum gelatinosum, its teeth. If you turn the cap over, the teeth are there and unmistakable. And they are present all the way from the margin of the cap down to the stipe where they begin to become diminutive but are still there, going perhaps one third to halfway up the stipe. They have no distinctive odor and they produce a white spore print. In many ways, they look a lot like a clear, whitish hedgehog mushroom that happens to be growing out of dead wood. And if they meet the criteria for a jelly fungus as well, that is, having a rubbery or jelly-like consistency, the nods are extremely high you have found Pseudohydnum gelatinosum. If you should find that they are common near you, feel free to forage these. However, in flavor, they will be like other jelly mushrooms, which is to say they will offer little distinct flavor of their own, so think of them as a nutritionist soup and stew thickener. I used to cook a lot with tofu years ago when I was doing my graduate studies, and I find it is best when dealing with jelly mushrooms in the kitchen generally to think of them as tofu. Finally, let's take a look at one more kind of jelly fungus, one which is very common and most people have seen even if they haven't before paid attention to it. This fungus is commonly known as an orange jelly, or perhaps more commonly as witch's butter, at least here in North America. And the common names actually refer to three different species, one of which is not even in the same genus. But they look so much alike that they are easily confused one for another. These species are Termella mesenterica, Termella aurantia, and finally Dacrymyces pomatus. In autumn, when the weather cools and the cold rains come, these fungi can frequently and commonly be found, especially here in the Acadian forest, sprouting out of dead wood. And the three species of fungi grow on a variety of coniferous and deciduous trees. In color, they are yellow to orangish, and when young, they tend to appear as little round yellow or orange buds emerging out of the wood, though as they mature, they look more like thick lobes and might stand individually like gelatinous sheets or massed together in such a way that they look like little fungal brains, hence the common name yellow brain fungus. This is one of the best photo examples I've ever taken of that form, though it is common enough, and here's another photo of the brain form that I captured a couple years before. The termella fungi are parasitic on other fungi that live on the wood and actually break it down. And the two different species of termella, aurantia and mesenterica, can easily be told from one another if they can be spotted in the presence of their host species, and there are other telltales by which they can be distinguished. And it is not too difficult to distinguish D. palmatis from them either. But specific species identification isn't the purpose of this video. Rather, it's to help you learn to identify the various forms of jelly fungi. So, when working with the fungi of the orange jelly or witch's butter group, look for yellow to orange fungi that are usually bright but will become darker as they age or dehydrate, emerging from dead deciduous or coniferous wood, in particular in the cool of autumn, especially after cold rains. They will offer no particular smell, and if you touch them to your tongue, they will also offer no particular flavor, which is common to jelly fungi. They will feel wet to the touch, and mesenterica may also feel greasy. As they dehydrate, as they are mostly liquid, they will lose a vast amount of size, but if rehydrated, will essentially reconstitute. They may appear in thick or thin lobes that will appear no more than one layer thick or may cluster together like little yellow brains. They are truly gelatinous, and if touched, will bend and yield or shaken, or if the wind is blowing over them, they may well jiggle. These are very common in my neck of the woods, and I harvest them now and then. I don't make a point to go out and harvest them because they are not substantial, as in literally, they are not substantial. If I spent all day foraging them, maybe I could fill a one or two liter bucket with them, but when I took them home to dry them and preserve them, that would reduce down to a small handful. However, sometimes in autumn, if I happen to be out hiking or hunting or camping, I might gather some and throw them into a stew pot or even fry them with some bacon or ham. And on days around the cottage, if my wife wants something different to put into whatever she's cooking, something like tofu, it's easy enough to go out and find them almost any time in late autumn. And even though they lack flavor, they are nutritious. This video should provide you with the basics for identifying jelly fungi. We have covered jelly ears, toothed jelly fungi, and witch's butter, also known as orange jelly fungi. And while each of these different fungi offers a very different morphology, they all share the common trait that their fruiting bodies have distinctly jelly-like consistencies, though the density of the jelly may vary, going from rubbery to a fairly soft gelatinous texture. The points we've gone over in this video are related to field identification. One can become more precise by bringing mushrooms into the home and making spore prints as described in a previous video, or even investing in a microscope and learning how to measure spores, colors, shapes, and sizes. 
But no matter how far you take your skills in the world of mushroom observation and identification, prepare to always be surprised. Mushrooms will never cease to amaze you with their striking variety of shapes and colors, their massive or minuscule sizes, and as you get deeper into studying them, their uncanny intelligence, and the way these ancient organisms have interwoven so much of the life we find here in the world. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like. Autumn leaves are turning brown, branches burn.